So, brothers and sisters, we've come over the course of this weekend to consider what is a wonderful study. Well, brothers and sisters and young people, I came to realise a couple of years ago just how extensive the type of the life of Hezekiah and his father Ahaz is in relation to things that are happening in our world today. So this entire weekend is going to be spent considering signs of the times. But against the backdrop of the prophecy of Isaiah and the things that happened in the life of Ahaz and Hezekiah, that form the framework, the prophetic framework. You see, God always uses some kind of historic framework when it comes to prophecy. And so that's what we're going to discover in our consideration of Hezekiah in Isaiah. It's a wonderful theme, and I, I know you'll, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy this because we're going to be talking about things that are happening right now in our world that were prophesied here uh, in the prophecy of Isaiah. You know, when you come to have a look at the, the simple fact that we have a unique situation in that the, the history of Hezekiah occurs three times in the Old Testament. Now that doesn't happen for anybody else. Three times. We have the record of Second Chronicles and Second Kings, of course, and we have a historical record in the book of Isaiah, which runs from chapter 36 to chapter 39, inclusive. And of course, either side of that, we have got the Emmanuel prophecies and the prophecies concerning the nations on one side, and then we've got the sermon prophecies of Isaiah from chapter 40 to chapter 66. So here, right in the middle of this wonderful book, which of course many believe to be the most profound book of the Bible, and I think there's probably good evidence that it is, here in this most profound book of the Bible, which sets forth the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in such detail, we have this strange thing, the historical account repeated again. Why would that be the case? And why is it that none of the early history of Hezekiah appears in the historical account of Isaiah? Why is it only the record of his sickness, the invasion of the Assyrians, and the overthrow of the Assyrian host? Well, of course, because it's the framework for the prophecies that sit around that historical account. So it's a very unique book, is Isaiah. So there we ask the question, and we're going to try and answer that question. Why the repetition of the Assyrian invasion and Hezekiah's sickness in Isaiah? You know, when you come to have a look at the history that's recorded of the times of Hezekiah, it's not just chapters 36 to 39 where the Assyrian invasion is at the forefront. Because if you go, as you can see there on the right-hand side of the screen, from chapter 10 through to chapter 36, there was these continual references to what happened in the invasion of the, of the Assyrians in the time of Hezekiah. So why is that the case? Well, we're going to see that as well. And Isaiah also records something that nobody else records. He records, as you can see there in that red box, Hezekiah's recovery and psalm of praise. Now this is the only place that you will find Hezekiah's psalm of praise in Isaiah chapter 38, verses 9 to 22. So again, there's, a, there's something unusual there. What is the Spirit doing here? Well, we're going to explore, God willing, all of those things over the course of this next two days. And there's some very wonderful and exciting things here, brothers and sisters, as we're going to see. So let's start with this man. I want you to come, if you would, to the, the record of, of 2 Chronicles and chapter 28. 2 Chronicles 28 records the appalling history of the thankfully brief reign fairly brief reign of Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Now of all the kings of Judah, he was the worst. And he even competes with the kings of Israel in the north, of whom there was not one good king. And there weren't too many good kings in Judah either. But Ahaz was absolutely awful. Now you can see the details of this man on the screen. His name means possessor or deceased. He certainly wasn't seized by the things of the truth, that's for sure. But there's also something unique about the record concerning Ahaz. You know what it is? He's the only king in Judah where the mother's name is not given. You know, the kings of Israel, you don't read about their mothers. But the kings of Judah you do, except for Ahaz. So I wonder why Ahaz is left out. Well, you know, when we look at the kings of Judah who were good kings, you know that 
the mother must have had something to do with that because in most cases they had bad fathers. Take Hezekiah himself. How would you like a father like Ahaz? You reckon you'd prosper in the truth with a father like Ahaz? Don't think so. But you see, his mother stepped into the breach. There's no doubt about that. His mother had a huge role in the life of Hezekiah. We're going to see what the meaning of her name is in a moment. But there's no record of the mother of Ahaz. Now who was his father? Well you can see there in the yellow, his father was Jotham. Now Jotham is also quite unique in the record because there's nothing adverse said about King Jotham, whose name means Yahweh is perfect or upright. Nothing adverse said about him except that the high places were not removed. So he set forth as a king that fixed his heart upon Yahweh. So Ahaz had a pretty good father, a very good father. But there's no mention of his mother. So I wonder whether that's suggesting to us that his mother might have been his problem. It could have been the case. His mother could have been the problem. Because he ended up a totally void, faithless individual. And you know, when you read what God has to say about him, it's pretty awful. You're in 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 22. I want to read that. It says this. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and 22. And in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against Yahweh. And he could almost feel the exasperation of God. This is that king Ahaz. Get the idea of that? Fancy having someone say that about you. Fancy having God say that about you. This is that king Ahaz. And when you read down the record from verse 19 of 2 Chronicles 28, it's an awful record. It outlines the heinous acts of this king that brought Judah low. See verse 19, it says this. Well, Yahweh brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. Now, I thought he was king of Judah. Didn't you? Well, of course he was king of Judah. So why does the Spirit say king of Israel? Well, because he was worse than the kings of Israel. God could even get some kind of response from Ahab, of whom it is said he was the worst king of Israel to his time. God could get response from him. He sent Elijah into the vineyard of Naboth, remember? And Ahab humbled himself and God said, well, I won't bring the judgments against him. It will be against his son. He could get no response from Ahaz. He had, he had not one single ounce of faith in his body. This was an unusual leader of God's people. And he brought Judah low. In that word low there, Kanar, is the root of Canaan. And it means to bend the knee, to humiliate to the earth. He brought Judah down to the earth, brothers and sisters. And the record goes on to say he, he made Judah naked. And that idea, of course, is to take clothing off, to expose. And Rohan translates it for he had given the rain in Judah. He let the rains go. And so the, the ecclesia suffered dreadfully. He transgressed sore, it says at the end of verse 19. And in the Hebrew, it's very, very definite. Ma'al, ma'al. And when you get a repetition of a Hebrew word like that, it's intense. And that's why it means treacherous, treachery. What an awful man he was. He was distinguished by a complete lack of faith and trust in Yahweh. You might want to come back to Isaiah chapter 7 that we read here this morning. Isaiah 7. Totally void of trust in Yahweh. And of course we've got to find that when we come to his son, Hezekiah, that there was no one like Hezekiah who trusted in Yahweh with all his heart. Absolute antithesis of his father. Isaiah chapter 7 speaks about the time when, of course, Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, joined in an alliance to destroy Judah and to put their own king upon the throne of Judah. We just read about that history in Isaiah chapter 7. And so Yahweh, seeing the terrible state that Judah was in, sends Isaiah the prophet to King Ahaz. And he comes to him and offers him a sign and he, he precedes that with the words of verse 9. He says, at the, in the second sentence of verse 9, If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. And there is a fundamental rule, brothers and sisters and young people, for our lives in the truth. If we will not believe, we're going nowhere. It's as simple as that. 
Faith is the core principle that will lead to eternal life. Ahaz had none of it. He was totally devoid of it. He goes on to say in verse 10, Moreover, Yahweh spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Yahweh thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, no more attempt Yahweh. You know why he wouldn't do that? He didn't believe in him. He did not believe in him. And we're going to see that in the behaviour of this man. He made all sorts of acknowledgements of the false gods. He even worshipped the gods of the nations who defeated him in battle. How stupid is that? He did all of that. He did not believe in Yahweh, the God of Israel. He had absolutely no confidence or trust in him at all. And that's why uh, when Brother Ralph read this, you see verse 13 there? In verse 13, this makes this interesting statement. Isaiah replies, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? You're wearying me, says Isaiah. But will you weary my God also? Yes, he was. He was wearing God out through his behaviour and his faithlessness, brothers and sisters. That's the kind of man we're dealing with. So what did he get up to? Well, he was distinguished by modelling himself on Ahab of Israel and worshipping Balaam. We're told that in 2 Chronicles 28. It might be an idea just to slip back to 2 Chronicles 28 and see this record very briefly. 2 Chronicles 28 sets it all out. In verse 2 it says, He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also modern images for Balaam. Well, it was Ahab who brought that into the northern kingdom of Israel. So he borrows that. He burned his children. Now what you notice, there's a difference between the record of Chronicles, 28 verse 3, and the record we're going to come to a little bit later on, 2 Kings chapter 16. We're going to see it's an important difference. Because it says here in verse 3 of 28, Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire. Now, by burning his children in the fire, it means that he immolated them. In other words, they died on the arms of Molech. And you're probably aware of what Molech was. He was a human form like God. And he had his arms stretched out. And they had a fire underneath the arms. And they would light the fire and lay the baby on the arms. And it's called the valley of the son of Hinnom because Hinnom means moaning. And you can imagine the moaning as this child was burnt on the arms of Moab. Well, how are you going to stop this? How are you going to stop this moaning from affecting the parents who foolishly have offered their children to Moab? Well, they called the place Tophet. You know what Tophet means? Drums. So you got moaning? Well, beat the drums. That'll drown out the moaning. That's the place that Ahaz took his children down to. And he burnt most of them, all of them, to death except one. And we're going to see how important this is. Because the record of King says that he passed Hezekiah through the fire. Hezekiah was his oldest boy. He was going to be the successor to the throne. He wasn't going to imitate him. So he passed him through the fire. But all the others got burnt to a cinder. That's this man, Ahaz. So we're dealing with something that that really troubled our God. This, this is how King Ahaz. What a frustrating thing it is when God has to deal with someone like that. Now we wouldn't be like that, of course. We would never offer our children to Molech. Would we? We'd never do that. Well, maybe some do. He sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. 2 Chronicles 28 verse 4. He's a remarkable type, brothers and sisters, a remarkable type of latter-day Israel. Now, I get criticised for saying things about latter-day Israel. People even call me anti-Semitic, which is so ridiculous, it's laughable. Because I just gave a Bible school on the work of Elijah and the second exodus of Israel, all about the recovery of Israel. Yeah, so don't listen to that kind of rubbish. But listen to the Bible. And the Bible says that when Christ comes, he's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So when you, are, you want to see what's happening in the land today? Go to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is the European capital for homosexuality. You don't worry about Amsterdam anymore. That's old hat. 
You go to Tel Aviv if you want to celebrate gay marriage and homosexuality. And they encourage it. The government encourages it. That's the nation God's dealing with today. They are faithless and they are corrupt. And Ahaz is the top of latter day Israel. See, that's why it's so important to understand why Ahaz and Hezekiah are here in the prophecy of Isaiah. Why this historical platform is laid. God is telling us you can interpret your own times by looking at this prophecy based upon this history. You don't need to guess. It's there for you to see. And we're going to see that in the course of our study. So he's a remarkable type of latter day Israel. His behaviour and the covenant that he makes with the Assyrians is a pattern for modern Israel. And Israel is in the throes right now of moving towards a covenant with Russia. Did you know that? I'm going to demonstrate that to you in our studies and later on this evening. They're on the road to a covenant with the Assyrians of the latter day. And it's all here prefigured in Hezekiah and Isaiah. So our weekend is going to be about the signs of the times. Ahaz was known for sacrificing to the God of his enemies because they helped them against him. Look at verse 23, 2 Chronicles 28. For he sacrificed over the gods of Damascus who smote him. Now come on, please, give me a break. If that nation has defeated you and you've sacrificed, what are you doing? I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? That's this king, Ahaz. He was known for destroying the vessels of the temple and closing its doors. So his policy in Ecclesia right was keep them out. Don't let them in. Don't hold T4C camps. Don't have youth conferences. Close the doors of the Ecclesia. You don't want people opening their Bibles. That's his policy. First thing Hezekiah did was to open the doors of the temple. Remember that? Day one, he opened the doors of the house of God. He was known for making a tenuous alliance with the Assyrians to help against his enemies. We're going to see he was known for building idolatrous altars throughout all Judah and its cities. 2 Chronicles 28, 24 and 25. And if you just want to slip back to 2 Kings, this is, this is another ridiculous example. 2 Kings chapter 16 says this about Ahaz. Second Kings 16 and verse 18, we read. Well, maybe go to verse 17. And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the labour from off them. What does that mean? Removing the labour. What's the labour for? Well, washing hands and feet. What does it represent? The washing of the water by the word? Yeah, get rid of the Bible, we don't need that. He took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it and put it upon a pavement of stones. And the covert for the Sabbath that they had built in the house, and the king's entry without turned he from the house of Yahweh for the king of Assyria. So he remodels the temple that Solomon built for the king of Assyria. So that when the king of Assyria turns up, he's got a special place in the temple where he can go that's being remodeled for him. What a man. This is that king Ahaz. He made Judah naked. And while he's doing all that, there's a mother at work on a young boy. His name is Hezekiah. And here we come to this man. Yahweh's trusting servant. His name means strengthened of Yah. He certainly wasn't strengthened by his father. His mother's name is Abijah. Yah is his father. And that proved to be true as well. So while Ahaz is messing up big time, his mother, I believe, is working hard to make sure that her son doesn't end up like her husband. There's been a few cases like that in the history of our movement, isn't there? All right? It happens. The role of mothers in the truth is underestimated. There's no question about that. I look back and I look at my heritage, brothers and sisters, and if it wasn't for what God did through my mother, I wouldn't be sitting in front of you today. She spent her life working to bring up her children. Fortunately, she had a good husband. 
Mothers can play an incredible part in the raising of children. They are a vital element of our ecclesial life. And the world today wants to put them up on some kind of pedestal and blank, break glass ceilings. Their most perfect role that they were formed for is done in the quietness of the home and the sidelines of the ecclesia as a support for those who are labouring up the front. That's their most important work. And those who have chosen to do that are producing fruit to the glory of our God. And those who have gone the other way are producing the opposite. You need to remember that. There's no question in my mind that Hezekiah's mother was an enormous influence in his life. It's all about this man, Hezekiah, a summary of his character. He was the greatest king of Judah and Israel since David, 270 years before. He was chosen by God as a type of Christ. We're going to see that come out very clearly. He was noted for outstanding trust in Yahweh his God. He took a positive approach to opening the doors of the ecclesia to all who would enter upon the basis of faith and truth. He wouldn't compromise the truth. He was the mover of the greatest reformation in Judah since the times of King Asa. And he was the restorer in the wake of the disasters of his father of the priesthood, the temple and its services. He was a very great character. Now I want you to come, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 31. We're going to look at two verses in 2 Chronicles to see the character of this man, Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 31. You know, we talk a lot about God manifestation and the whole purpose of our calling to the truth is that we might reveal the character of God. Well, that's exactly what it is. And here's the outcome in the life of Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 31 verse 20. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before Yahweh his God. Now the word right there, as you can see on the screen, means simply straight. He was a straight man. There was integrity and honesty in Hezekiah. Fundamental to success in the truth. But then it says truth. Now this happens to be the word emeth. Emeth is the word that God chooses to represent his own characteristic of stability, certainty and trustworthiness and that's what emeth means you know we use the term we like to use the term the goodness and severity of god we got that wrong we got it wrong paul is using it in the context of god's actions towards his people he showed mercy when they responded to him but when they turned their back on him he showed severity yeah this is not about severity brothers and sisters this key element of the character of God is not about severity. Oh, it can produce severity if you defy it because he will not compromise. He will not change. He will be loyal to his own principles. He will never, ever fail them. And if you break them, you'll suffer. But it's not about severity. It's about the key element of the character that you and I must develop. And you know the thing that's lacking in the modern world? Integrity. And honesty. That's what's lacking. There was a time here in Texas when oil barons would come together and they would have a multi-billion dollar project and they would have no documentation, agree to spend huge quantities of money on a handshake. True? 30, 40 years ago, a handshake was good enough in Texas. Today you've got to have a pile of paper this high, don't you? Because you'll be in court to argue. Honesty and integrity has gone out the window in the modern world. It is a key element to life in the truth. If we can't be honest before God, we're not going to be honest with each other. Honesty before God is critical. Brothers and sisters, Hezekiah had it. He had emeth. He had that quality of the Father's character. But he had more. Turn the page to 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 32. Chapter 32 and verse 32 says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, etc. That word goodness there is kesed, C-H-E-S-E-D. It means loving kindness, which is the way Rotherham translates it throughout his translation. This is the word that Yahweh chooses to represent his qualities of mercy and compassion. 
The word has the idea of, of leaning down, bending over to show kindness to an inferior. And so this is what God does to you and me. And we've got to learn this characteristic. Not dealing with inferiors, but dealing with the children of God and others. We've got to learn that characteristic and it takes time because it's not naturally born into man. And neither is honesty and integrity. So here we've got Hezekiah manifesting the character of Almighty God, which is the purpose of our calling. He's also, as you well know from the history of this man, the suffering servant of Yahweh. And his experiences provide the framework for a marvellous type of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to come to Isaiah 53, if you wouldn't mind. I want to explore this particular avenue now of the life of Hezekiah, the suffering servant of Yahweh. In Isaiah 53, which of course we know is about our Lord Jesus Christ, we read this in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. You could not have got drier ground than existed in the palace of the king of Judah when Hezekiah was born and raised. It was terribly dry ground. His father, devoid of any principles at all, and of any faith and trust in God. Completely dry. And we read, of course, in 2 Chronicles 28, verse 3, that, that Ahaz burnt his children in the fire. Now, just keep something in Isaiah, if you can. Just pop something in Isaiah, chapter 53. And come back to 2 Kings 16, verse 3. And what, I might just add this, brothers and sisters. The very nature of this subject requires that we are going to have to flick you backwards and forwards. We've got, we've got three historical accounts. Okay, so we're going to have to flip you backwards and forwards to get the full story. So you might like, if you have some bookmarks, you might like to pop a bookmark in the, in the chapters that we're dealing with in a particular state, so that we can go backwards and forwards fairly quickly. In 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 3, we read this. It's about Ahaz. Verse 2 tells us, and in verse 3 we read, But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, Yea, and made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations. Now, did you notice the difference with 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 3? That said, he burnt his children in the fire, which means he immolated them. But when we come to Hezekiah, it says, because obviously he's the successor to the throne, it says he passed him through the fire. Now, have you ever seen a child that has uh, gone up to a stove and there's a, a pot of boiling water on a stove and they've pulled the boiling water over them and it's gone down their face and over their body? Have you ever seen a child? Well, nowadays, of course, they've got plastic surgery and all sorts of things that they can cover that up. In my day, no. I went to school with a child that had done that and he had a red blotch on his scalp right down his face, right down here. Red, bright red. That was there for life. Okay? That's what happened to Hezekiah. You can't put a baby on the arms of Moloch with flames coming up from underneath without being burned very severely. Now he was taken off before he died, but he had to be offered to, to Moloch. Right? But he was taken off before he died. And he ends up with terrible, terrible burn marks. And his face is what suffers the most. It will be the pitiest. You know why we can say that? Well, we can say it because this is the basis of the words that are spoken about our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we can back, come back to Isaiah 53. Look what the rest of verse 2 says. Isaiah 53 verse 2. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it were, as it were our faces from him, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now I'm not sure what the margin of your Bible has got alongside of verse 3, but mine says that he hid as it were his face from us. And why wouldn't you if you were 
badly scarred by the burning of the fires of Molech. Why wouldn't you? Perhaps, brothers and sisters, perhaps this is why Hezekiah never married. Now, kings, of course, in those days could marry who they like. Like Solomon had a thousand. They could have married any number of women. Hezekiah never married, never had any children. And that was the problem, wasn't it? That was the problem. That when Isaiah came in and said, set your house in order, you're going to die. He says, well, there's no successor to the throne of David. I don't have any children. There's no son who can be king in my place. Huge problem. Which is why he turned his face to the wall and pleaded with his God and was given 15 years extension to life so that he might marry and have a son. Now, why wouldn't a king who was 39 years of age Oh, I've got a son who's 30, he's not married yet, just likes being with his parents. But, but why would a 39-year-old king who can marry who he likes not be married? Well, because he was too ashamed to show his face. That's why. Couldn't imagine marrying a lady and have to look in her face, you know, like that. And he's got this terrible scarring. Isaiah 52 verse 14 says of our Lord Jesus Christ it says as ma- and as many were astonished or astonished at thee his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men well we know what that means in relation to Christ and they said to him thou art not yet 50 years old he was only 33 he looked like he's 50 when they butchered him, slapped his face, jammed a crown of thorns on his head, and it was all blood running down, and they beat him black. Yeah, of course his visage was marred more than any man. Hezekiah was the type. I want to prove that to you. I can say it. That doesn't mean anything. I want to prove it to you. That Hezekiah is the type of the suffering servant of Yahweh, our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to come to Matthew chapter 16. Now Matthew 16 is the preparation for the transfiguration of chapter 17. And we're quite familiar with these words. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to pick it up from Let's say uh, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, the hearing son of the Spirit. And that's what Simeon, son of Jonah, means. Jonah means the dove. And the dove is the symbol in the scripture for the Spirit. So when you, when you spell that out, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, thou hearing son of the Spirit, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, Petros, a movable stone, yeah, you'll be pushed around, you're not stable yet, Peter, but upon this rock, Petra, an immovable platform, I will build my ecclesia. Now, of course, the immovable platform was the statement that came from Peter's mouth. Thou art the anointed, the son of the living God. That was the platform upon which the ecclesia would be built. But look what he says next in verse 18. And the gates of hell, Hades is the Greek word, the gates of hell, or the grave, shall not prevail against it. So guess where that comes from? Isaiah 38, verse 10. All right. It comes from the song of Hezekiah when he was delivered and given 15 years extra life. He wrote the psalm, the song that was sung on the occasion. And in it he says, I've escaped from the gates of Sheol, which is the Old Testament word for the grave. And the Lord Jesus Christ picks up the words that come from the mouth of Hezekiah and says, that was me. That was a type of me. What happened to Hezekiah? 
the marring of his visage, the sufferings he went through, that was a type of me. But he hadn't finished yet. He's not finished. Because he goes on to say this in verse 19 to Peter. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Pope loves that verse. Because he thinks he can lock everybody up on the basis of that verse. It's got nothing to do with the Pope, of course. It's got everything to do with only binding on earth what God has already bound in heaven. And it comes from. Where does it come from? Isaiah chapter 22. I want you to come back to Isaiah 22. You know what Isaiah 22 is about, don't you? It's about the Assyrian invasion of the land in the days of Hezekiah and the response of God's people to it. And we'll come to this, God willing, tomorrow morning in our exhortation. We're going to have a look a little bit closer at Isaiah 22. Very important chapter for us. But when you get towards the end of this chapter, we're going to see these two men later on in our studies. These two men that were right-hand men to, to, uh, to King Hezekiah. The first of those is the man Shebner in verse 15. He was faithless. You know what he was doing when he was standing there listening to Rabshakeh on the wall as Hezekiah's emissary? What he's doing? He had men digging his tomb. He did not think he would survive the Assyrian invasion. He had men labouring to dig his own grave. Faithless. But there was another man there. And his name was Eliakim. We read of him in verse 20. And shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Eliakim means Ael sets up, or Ael raises. He was a faithful man, and he becomes a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 21, I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah, and the king. Here's the words. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. That's where Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 comes from. Christ is quoting Isaiah 22 and verse 22. So what's he saying to us? He's saying, look at Hezekiah. And what happened to him was a type of me. He was the suffering servant of Yahweh. And here I am. Here's the antitype. Here's the fulfillment. All that was set forth in Hezekiah. So you see the contrast between Hezekiah and his father? Isn't that amazing, brothers and sisters? And that's exactly what God's going to do for his people. They are corrupt today like Ahaz. But when Christ is finished with them, they're going to be like Hezekiah. They're going to be like him. That's what this story is about. So I want to talk now about his disease. What disease did he have that was going to bring him to the grave? 2 Kings 20 talks about a boil. 2 Kings chapter 20. When Isaiah comes in and he says, take a, take a poultice, put it on this boil. So in verse 7 we read, Isaiah said, take a lump of figs and they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. And this word boil, shakin in the Hebrew, means a boil, or an inflamed spot, or an inflammation, or an eruption in the flesh. It just so happens there are 13 occurrences of this word in the Old Testament. Now, many of you, of course, will be fully aware that 13 is the biblical number for rebellion. All right? So this, this has got to do with a problem, and it does have to do with a problem. Four of those 13 occurrences are in Exodus 9, verses 9 to 11, of the sixth plague upon the Egyptians. 4 on Leviticus chapter 13 verses 18 to 23 of the eruption of leprosy in the form of a boil is translated botch, the botch of Egypt in Deuteronomy 28 verses 27 and 35 of an incurable disease. It is used of Job's affliction in Job 2 and verse 7. It is used of twice of Hezekiah's boil. So what's the conclusion? It's plain, isn't it, that this boil is actually related to leprosy. 
was some kind of eruption in, in Hezekiah related to leprosy, which would have poisoned his blood and he would have died of blood poisoning. So he was stricken. Remember the context? We should come back to Isaiah 53. See, I said I'm going to flick you backwards and forwards. Come back to Isaiah 53. So what are we reading Isaiah 53 in the context of Christ? Well, we read of Christ being deemed to be stricken of God. See in verse 4? Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And this word stricken, nagar, is often used in relation to leprosy. The, um, the um, Expositor's Bible comments in this way. Smith, when he's dealing with the book of Isaiah, says, the English translate, translations have masked the leprous figure that stands out so clearly in the original Hebrew. So this word nagar that we see in Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 8 is used over 50 times in Leviticus 13 of the plague of leprosy. The word healed here in Isaiah 53 verse 5, the very last word of that verse, rapha, is used of the healing of lepers in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. And there are further allusions to leprosy here. Isaiah 52 14, 53 verse 3 and 10. All add weight to the, to, to the hints that we're dealing here with the problem of leprosy. Now Christ, brothers and sisters, was esteemed. Notice that he was esteemed a leper by men. And they hid their faces from him, verse 3. So the question has to be asked and answered, doesn't it? How then was Christ related to leprosy? Seeing this word, or these words that are used, clearly refer to the problem of leprosy. What was his relationship to leprosy? Well, let's be very clear about this. Leprosy in the Bible is a symbol for sin. And the Son of God never sinned. The punishment of Miriam, Numbers 12, the punishment of Gehazi, wiped all over, the punishment of King Isaiah, where leprosy burst out of his forehead, all indicate a punishment for sin. Don't they? It's just very clear. Christ did not sin. It was his possession of human nature, which is the source of sin in all others, that provided his connection with leprosy. But in him, it never erupted through personal transgression as it did in the aforenamed Miriam, Gehazi, and Isaiah, and you and me. It never erupted in him in that way. So it is by metonymy that he was made sin for us, says the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 21. And in Romans 6 verse 6, we considered last night briefly in the readings. He destroyed the body of sin. He took human nature and he crucified it. It is the source of all sin. He never succumbed to it. So he had the problem, but it never erupted in him through transgression. I want to show you this in 1 Peter chapter 2. Come to 1 Peter 2, and just if you can, just keep your hand in Isaiah 53. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now this is what I love about the scripture, brothers and sisters. I don't need to give you my opinion. And in fact, if you, if you want my opinion, you're stupid. Right? I don't need to give you my opinion. The Bible speaks for itself. The Bible is its own interpreter, and that's the problem we've got. There are too many opinions that are not based upon the Bible. So let's let the Bible do its work for us. And it does. It's just a matter of seeing it, that's all. It's there. It's a matter of seeing it. And here we've got one of those classic examples of a New Testament quotation from a context, not just words, from a context. So what's Peter talking about in 1 Peter chapter 2? We're well, talking about Christ, see, in verse 21, leaving us an example. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now where's that coming from? you think? Well, it's clear. Even the margin of my Bible says it's cited from Isaiah 53 and verse 9. 
And Isaiah 53 verse 9 says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit or guile in his mouth. Yeah, so Peter, under inspiration, is quoting from Isaiah 53. What's his context? Read on. Verse 23. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes he were healed. So where does that come from? By whose stripes he were healed. Isaiah 53 and verse 4. You see what Peter's doing? He's quoting the prophecy of Isaiah. And what he's doing is telling us but Isaiah 53 is all about the principle of metonymy. It's about our Lord Jesus Christ bearing our nature, the source of all sin, and dealing with it successfully. He overcame the problem of leprosy at source. He dealt with it every single day. It never erupted in sin in that man. Straight out of Isaiah 53. Now I'm going to conclude with you in this first study, in 2 Kings chapter 18, if you want to come to 2 Kings 18. And here we have the record of Hezekiah coming to the throne in his first acts as king of Judah in the wake of the dreadful reign of his father Ahaz. We read in verse 3, for example, he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh according to all that David his father did. Not Ahaz. Ahaz wasn't his father. What it means natural father, he was not his spiritual father. Hezekiah's spiritual father was David. And then you read this in verse 4. He removed the high places, he broke the images and cut down the groves and broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan, a piece of brass. <laughs> now come on. You know what happened? In 2 Chronicles 32 verse 12, when Sennacherib comes along, he accused Hezekiah of removing the religious icons of Judah. They were idolatrous, of course, but to some Jews, those icons would have been precious and they would have objected. How dare, how dare you take the brazen serpent that Moses and Aaron built in the wilderness that's been with us for hundreds of years and destroy it. How dare you do that? You know, I go to some ecclesias which are very nice, it's lovely ecclesial halls and big organs and that sort of thing. And you go on a Sunday morning with all this silverware out there. I guarantee if I was to get it and throw it in the rubbish bin, I would be railroaded out of there in a hurry. It's almost become like this. This is so important to us. You ever seen that before? People today treasuring icons of some kind? Well, he took it and burned it and destroyed it. Why? Why would he do that? Well, we're told why. It says, in verse 4, For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, to a snake, to a serpent. Should we be burning incense to the serpent? Well, of course not, because the serpent represents all that God is opposed to. And to worship it in any form, to give any, any platform to the serpent in our life is wrong. It's just wrong. And Hezekiah knew that. We destroyed it. But there's another reason here. There's another reason that's often missed. So why does Hezekiah destroy the brazen serpent and cause so much heartache for some in the nation? Well, his actions were motivated by two factors. One, we consider the serpent was being worshipped. Wrong. And there was no pole. No pole. You know when Moses and Aaron made the brazen serpent in Numbers 21? Yahweh said to them, put the serpent on a pole. Remember that? Yeah. You know that first, the, the first time the word nes, N-E-C, which is used twice in Numbers 21, in verse 8 and in verse 9? You know what the first occurrence of that is? Exodus chapter 17, 
when Moses made an altar after the incident at Rephidim with the, with the Amalekites, he built an altar, he called it Yahweh Nisai, or he who will be manifested on a pole. That's the first occurrence of the word Ness. He who will be manifested on a pole. And in John chapter 3 verse 14, you know what Christ said? Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So what's the most important thing here? The pole. Isn't it? What do you do with the serpent, brothers and sisters, with him? Worship it? No. You crucify it. With its affections and lusts, that's what you do with it. But there's no pole here. And First Corinthians 2, verse 2. Where Paul says this, For I determine not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ. Is that all? No. Say Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's why you say to the Galatians, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. And when Hezekiah came to the throne and he saw these idiots worshipping a serpent, he said, you idiots, he takes it and destroys it. Because life in the truth, brothers and sisters, is not about worshipping flesh. It's about crucifying it. And there was no pole. What a man. No wonder God chooses him as a pattern for our Lord Jesus Christ.